Right. I hope I'm audible. A oh, very good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 5M club. So we'll go ahead with our meditation and then we'll continue from where we stopped yesterday. And we'll be starting our new chapter in the journey within your subconscious mind that is loss governing our subconscious mind. So I hope you guys are all ready. So let's start our meditation. We'll spend a couple of minutes. Five minutes and then we'll go ahead with our book review. So, uh, as I said, uh, in fact, as we have been trying for the past several days, uh, sit in any uh, position uh, based on your comfort and convenience. And you need not restrict or control any thoughts. All you need to do is just sit in a relaxed position. I mean, you can even lie down. But the problem with lying down is you might go into sleep. I mean, it can happen even while sitting, but the chances are less comparatively. You can sit in a comfortable position, close your eyes, and then try not to control or restrict your thoughts. Let them flow. Just focus on your breathing and experience that stillness. So ultimately the objective is to be having more awareness of the present moment as we have been discussing. And all we are trying to do is scientifically we are trying to enter into alpha state which is considered to be a meditative state or a relaxed state. And you know why we're trying to enter this alpha state? Because it's considered as a doorway to our subconscious mind. And once you start implanting ideas into your subconscious mind, you know, you will be manifesting them very soon without any doubt. You just experience and enjoy the stillness. Enjoy being in alpha state.
Okay, so today we have uh, two members doing this live session. So even he is trying to do a sort of meditation. Sleep is, in fact, the best meditation, isn't it? So let's allow him to meditate throughout this session. We have another guy over there who is meditating, who has been meditating all the time. So let's uh, go ahead. Hi, Inside Eye. Hi, Ignatius. A very good morning. So let's start with our new chapter today. And the book I'm referring to is The Genie Within Your Subconscious Mind by Harry W. Carpenter. So, the name of the chapter is Loss of Subconscious Mind. L-A-W-S, Loss. So, lesson four. Uh, the introduction part. Hi, Rupak. A very good morning. The laws of mathematics must be obeyed to get correct mathematical solutions. A correct solution might be obtained on occasion, even though a law is disobeyed, but it will not happen often. Maybe scientific breakthroughs and all. It's not different with the subconscious mind. I would like to say that if you obey the laws of subconscious mind discussed in this lesson, you will be successful always. But no one can make such a promise. However, I can say that if you disobey the laws discussed in this lesson, you will be much less successful than if you do obey them. Some of the laws are simple and their explanation is short. I will not embellish on them simply to make the section longer to seem more important. First and foremost, repetition, repetition, repetition. So, till now we have seen, uh, like, what's the difference between conscious and subconscious mind. We have seen the potential of subconscious mind and all. And once we understand these laws, we can master and we can, you know, uh, what, what can I say, tap into its potential, right? To enhance our own lives, to be successful, to accomplish all our dreams. So first and foremost, a repetition. New programs accepted by subconscious mind must be nurtured. When programming the subconscious mind, it is necessary to repeat the conditioning often until it is totally accepted by the subconscious mind. After it is accepted, the program should be repeated periodically to ensure that it remains dominant. So many of us wonder like why we are not able to learn new desirable habits. One of the reasons why we fail is lack of repetition. So according to a research uh, which we have been mentioning, 21 days or try it out for 3 weeks. Not exactly 21 days all the new habits. But periodic repetitions, constant repetitions will definitely work out. So new programs accepted by subconscious mind should be nurtured. And when programming the subconscious mind, it's necessary to repeat the conditioning often until it is totally accepted by subconscious mind. After it is accepted, the program should be repeated periodically to ensure that it remains dominant. Number two, emotion. Attaching emotion to a suggestion makes it more effective. Emotion is a power in the subconscious mind. You must use it when programming your subconscious mind to be successful. Let's suppose waking up early in the morning is a new habit which we are all trying to nurture. Once we attach it to an emotion like what does it actually mean waking up early in the morning? What's the driving force? If you remember in dinner sessions I have been asking you this like to wake up early in the morning what's the driving force? I mean you want to be successful. You want to have a fantastic day. You want to address your priorities. How does it make you feel? I mean, any kind of emotion, attach it to this, you know, a new habit. It will be easy for you. And in fact, it will be more effective for you to implement. Now, with present tense, the conscious mind lives by time as we know it. Namely, past, present and future. So, in fact, this time factor is associated with conscious mind. Whereas a subconscious mind only lives in the present. 
in the subconscious mind the past is merely present recollections and the future is present predictions which is very interesting the following example explains the significance of using present tense i will be happy in first to the subconscious mind that you are not i'm sorry i'm really sorry uh, it's toffee which is trying to distract me but it's okay come on toffee please join us so we have the other guy joining us now yeah i think we can go ahead as usual so now uh, she is she will be you know entering into a state of meditation please don't get bothered hi toffee please carry on with your meditation the following examples explains the significance of using the present tense i will be happy in first to the subconscious mind that you are not now happy but you will be happy in future first the future never arrives so do not ask for something in future the future is like the carrot held out in front of someone as something to chase but never catch second not happy implication is a goal given to your subconscious mind when you say you will be happy your subconscious mind then obliges by keeping you unhappy because you're telling yourself okay i will be happy you're talking about your happiness in future tense instead you can say i am happy i am currently happy then you're giving your subconscious mind the input that you are currently happy so the correct phrasing is in the present tense that is i am happy but you say your pet dog just died you flunked in exams you received an inv- invitation from irs and you are not happy okay but if you want to pull out of the dole drums then you need to say and think i am happy now being happy now will be the goal given to your subconscious mind neurotransmitters travel both ways from mind to body and body to mind once your subconscious mind accepts the concept of being happy that message in turn is sent to cells in your body and then your body responds by acting happy using the present tense does seem awkward to the conscious mind but it is necessary you might say i'm having problems now but if you implant this idea it works out simply for example when you programmed your mental alarm clock you said to yourself i am wide awake at 7 o'clock not i will be awake at 7 o'clock so there there is a difference right so present tense subconscious mind works in present tense so that's the third uh, law and next one fourth one dominant concept the subconscious mind will accept only one concept to be true at any time more than one concept it can be thought habit program can be held in the subconscious mind at the same time but only one will be binding thus when subconscious mind recognizes a concept as true that concept guides and dominates your actions the subconscious mind will only give up on dominant concept when a stronger opposing concept is impressed on it the significance is that a concept cannot be eliminated it is embedded in your uh, subconscious mind and your subconscious mind uh, doesn't forget a negative concept must be overpowered with a stronger positive one the good news is that the source of concept doesn't have to be known it just has to be overpowered with a positive one which gives you a possibility of telling yourself or giving a uh, this positive inputs in spite of having so many challenges in your current life and your subconscious mind has a power to accept them because only one dominant idea can exist in your subconscious mind at, at a given point of time imagine you are a large balance you know the balance right extend both arms out sideways and parallel to the ground in each hand you hold a balance pan imagine you are a flip flop balance as soon as anything is put on one pan, on pan it drops down all the way this balance weighs each binding idea you have of yourself on a particular subject your right hand has a tray that holds negative concepts and the left hand has a tray that holds the positive concepts of yourself the balance will flip one way or the other depending on the dominant concept 
suppose you are brought up in a healthy family environment your parents gave you lots of love and nurturing the self image you develop is poise and self confidence so these positive concepts go on the left tray and the left side of the balance goes down and stays down you grow up self confident conversely suppose a particular person was brought up in a dysfunctional family environment the particular person was bombarded with negative stimuli about himself you are no good you will never mount uh, to anything you are a bad boy you never do anything right you never learn and so on and so forth for 20 years he lived in this family environment where he was constantly through repetition given this negative affirmations and much of the time they were said with anger or sarcasm that is emotions the person believes in those so at subconscious level which manifests actually through actions years later that particular person knows in his conscious mind he is smart educated good looking but for some unknown reason he has a low self esteem that is a subconscious mind when conscious mind and subconscious mind are in conflict as discussed previously the subconscious mind always wins that's the interesting point here to change this low esteem to self confidence john doesn't have to determine where he got his low self esteem he doesn't worry about past the, he, he need not worry about his upbringing anymore because let's say he simply has to overpower his concept of low self esteem with one of a poise and self confidence he must give himself positive healthy esteem building affirmations he must feed the left balance pan until one day the balance flips and we lost the subconscious mind has accepted the positive concept now self confidence is a dominant concept guiding this person's actions john is that for example a person named john was exposed to years of negative affirmations how can he overcome this negative trait which had a built up over years in a short time he can accelerate the process by programming his positive programs in the alpha state and by using methods described in later lessons william glasser md wrote this concept wrote a book schools without failure suggesting this concept be used in schools he recommended emphasizing positive and eliminating negative feedback He suggested there be no condemnation by teachers and no failing grades. He held that children would graduate with higher self-esteem and they would learn faster, easier, and joyfully. This concept has much merit, but it was not accepted by our school systems, unfortunately, which is nothing but stupidity. I mean, you have a very young person, right, uh, who is trying to understand the world, who is trying to power himself, and then. Uh, for his own good and for greater good and you say you are failed you say you are bad uh, and in fact through actions through marks and through grades we divide students we categorize affecting their health self esteem in fact even the so called ranker he is under constant stress to perform i mean where is success in this uh, where is joy in learning all that becomes cliche and you know it serves no purpose the only purpose is to get marks and ranks just for sake of acceptance in society including in our own family unfortunately that's a sad reality this technique for teaching is not used on our children but it is used on animals animal trainers are most successful when they ignore negative behavior from animal and reinforce positive behavior when it occurs dr skinner a famous psychologist was one of the pioneers of this technique uh, next law expectation in the previous lesson you learned that the subconscious mind is a goal seeking computer whatever goals are supplied the subconscious mind seeks to fulfill them a sincere expectation is a goal given to your subconscious mind and law can be stated when subconscious mind expects something it makes the thing happen here are a couple of examples let's see volunteers were inoculated in the right arm with tuberculin from a red syringe tuberculin causes redness and swelling even i had undergone the test during my phd consequently each time the right arm reacted with redness and swelling as expected 
At the same time, the volunteers were inoculated in left arm with a salt solution from a green syringe. No reaction occurred in left arm, also as expected, because it's just a saline or a salt water. After three months of inoculation, the tuberculin and salt solution were reversed in red and green syringes without volunteers' knowledge. When they were inoculated with switched solutions, as expected by volunteers, the right arm reacted with redness and swelling, while the left arm exhibited no reaction, even after switching. Contrary to medical science, the body reacted according to expectation in the subconscious mind. I mean, this is nothing but placebo effect. I mean, even placebo effect works on the same principles, works along the same principles, right? So sociologists, another example, studying the culture in the Turabia, Torbi and Island found that premarital sex was considered okay, but premarital pregnancy was not. The natives did not use contraception, yet premarital pregnancy was virtually unknown. The ingrained culture conditioned them so that they absolutely did not expect to get pregnant until they were married. You might say they might be using contraception, but no, no contraception, but still premarital sex in clay to premarital, you know, pregnancy, virtually unknown. And another example, you have probably known or heard of a couple that could not conceive. They adopted a baby and soon after the wife gets pregnant. One could argue that having a child unblocked her belief that she could not have a baby of her own. To reiterate, expectation is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, we'll examine the most documented phenomena based on this law, placebos, as I was just mentioning. Now, let's look into this placebos. So, the word placebo means, I shall please. Drug companies must factor in the placebo effect when testing every new drug. So, in fact, the word placebo means, I shall please. So, placebos are pills that look the same as the medicine being tested but they contain only the inert filler used with a real medicine. This filler has no medicinal value, yet in all studies, at least 30% of patients report the same beneficial results as those who use the real medicine. The placebo effect cannot be explained other than the patient's belief system causing the same healing effect as the real medicine. When patients are unaware a medication is being given to them, the placebo effect disappears. When the patients are unaware, there is no expectation. Tests of this nature were run to prove that placebo effect is truly due to expectation and not another factor. Dr. Sternbach in 1964 administered a pill containing no active ingredients to a group of volunteers. The first time the pill was given, the group was told that they were receiving a drug that would stimulate a strong churning sensation in their stomachs. The next time the volunteers were told the pill would reduce stomach activity and make them feel full and heavy. The third time the volunteers were told the pill was placebo and would serve as a control. Though Dr. Sternbach administered the same pill in all three occasions, two thirds of the subjects stomach activity responded according to instructions they received before taking the pills. The subject's stomachs reacted the way the subjects expected them to react. Placebo effect. Studies have shown that a patient's belief can be dramatically affected by the way the medicine is dosed. A big pill is more effective than a small one. A colored pill is more effective than a white one. A bitter pill is more effective than a blank one. An injection is more effective than a pill. Medication administered by a doctor is more effective than administered by a nurse. And medication administered by doctor in white coat is more effective than doctor in straight clothes. A patient's belief in the medicine is set up by the way the medication is given. Dr. Benson in Timeless Medicine stated that placebos can be as much as 90% effective, as much as 90% as real medicine depending on how they are administered. When testing a drug for bleeding ulcers, Doctors found that the drug was 70% successful when introduced as a potent new drug, but only 30% successful when introduced as an experimental drug. 
The importance of doctor-patient relationship has been reported in recent studies. The placebo effect is stronger when the doctor views patients as active participants as opposed to passive, just do as they tell you relationship. Unfortunately, that's how uh, the current scenario is, at least in majority of the cases. In an experiment reported by Dr. John Borsinko, one third of women cancer patients given a placebo in place of chemotherapy medication lost their hair. The only reason they lost their hair was that they expected to lose hair. The placebo effect is even effective in surgery. Dr. Bruce Mosley Jr. used arthroscopic surgery on five patients, while five others went through a sham surgery in which he made to the access cuts, but no corrective surgery was performed. Two years later, those who had the sham surgery reported the same amount of benefit from pain and swelling reduction as those who had the real surgery. Four of the people in the placebo group even recommended the surgery to their friends. Discussion about the placebo effect would be incomplete without the case of Mr. Wright, reported in 1957. Mr. Wright was dying of cancer and his doctor, Bruno Klopfer, MD, gave him only a few days to live. So Mr. Wright found out about a new medicine, Krebiosin, that was being studied at the hospital and he begged Dr. Klopfer to give it to him. Though Dr. Klopfer knew it was too late for any medicine to cure Mr. Wright, he relented and gave Mr. Wright an injection on Friday. When Dr. Klopfer returned on Monday, he wondered if the patient would be even alive. Mr. Wright astounded the doctor by being up and active. Dr. Klopfer reported that Mr. Wright's tumors were melting like butter on a hot stove. Mr. Wright went home, resumed normal activities until he heard that Cribiogen was not as effective as hoped for. Mr. Wright was soon back in hospital and dying. Dr. Klopfer realized it was the placebo effect that was curing Mr. Wright, so he told him that Cribiogen used in the recently reported study was an old batch. The doctor gave him uh, gave his patient another injection, telling him he had obtained some fresh cribiosin. Again, the tumor melted like butter in a hot stove, and Mr. Wright left the hospital. Another report came out stating cribiosin, K-R-E-B-I-O-Z-E-N, was ineffective and research was abandoned. After hearing of this report, Mr. Wright returned to hospital and died a few days later. I will end the placid effect with a quote from Norman Cousins. Cousins wrote books and taught college graduate courses based on his own healing from a fatal disease using laughter, laughter to stimulate immune system, the inherent healing system in his body. Over the years, um, medical science has identified the primary systems of body as circular, digestive, endocrine, autonomic, parasympathetic, immune system, etc., but the two other systems that are central to proper functioning of human being need to be emphasized. The healing system and the belief system. The two work together. The healing system is a way the body mobilizes all its resources to combat diseases. The belief system is often the activator of healing. Right? So we'll stop here. And we'll continue from this point tomorrow in tomorrow's 5M class. So we've seen extensively about uh, some specific laws which govern subconscious mind that is repetition, emotion, present tense, dominant concept, expected and expectation. The best example is placebo. So it's not magic. It's all about our belief system and there are a scientific. In fact, uh, presented some examples and case reports. Also, there is scientific evidence. Uh, that is still emerging on how this actually happens, right? So I hope you enjoyed this session and uh, have a fantastic day ahead. If you have any queries or you need any assistance from our side, always feel free to contact us through mail at proudtobedentist.gmail.com. So these guys are napping happily. I reckon even you are. Okay, take care. I'll see you tonight in dinner session. Session over, Tiger. Coffee. Over. You can sleep again. <laughs> Hi, Ria. Very good morning. These are obedient students of mine. Yeah, you can sleep.
Bye.